call before rulers. Acts 24 to 26. Paul was an apostle chosen by God to take the gospel to the world. He was the first missionary and the greatest preacher of all time. In this lesson, we will see how Paul boldly proclaimed the gospel to the Roman governors, Felix and Agrippa. What does the word defend mean? Defend can mean that we resist an attack or protect someone from harm. For an example, ancient China built a great wall to defend or protect its borders from invaders. Defend can also mean that we seek to justify or argue for a person or a case. For example, when we stand up for our country, we are defending our freedoms. In this lesson, we are going to learn how the Apostle Paul boldly defended the gospel to the Roman governors Felix and Agrippa. He told them his personal testimony and shared with them the promises of God about salvation. This lesson comes from the book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament. This book was written by Luke. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell about the life of Christ. The fifth book, Acts, tells about the beginning of the church and the life of the Paul the Apostle. Let's say the first five books of the New Testament together. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Paul was an apostle chosen by God to take the gospel to the world. Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus and revealed that he was really the Son of God. Paul believed in Jesus that day, and he was a changed man. God called Paul to be the apostle who would bring the gospel to the Gentiles and to suffer much for his name. He became the first missionary and the greatest preacher of all time. Paul made three missionary journeys to Greece and Syria. Despite much opposition, they preached the gospel and several new churches were established in Asia Minor and Macedonia. The gospel spread throughout the region and many Gentiles believed in Jesus as their Savior. It was not easy to start churches. Some Jews, who were jealous and did not believe in Jesus, would stir up riots and try to stop them. Paul and his traveling companions were thrown into prison and run out of towns but they kept on preaching about Jesus. During this time, Paul wrote several letters to the churches he had started. These letters gave instruction in how to live the Christian life and would later become part of our New Testament. They were Galatians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. At the close of his third missionary journey, Paul told the churches that the Holy Spirit was leading him to return to Jerusalem. Paul realized that the trip was dangerous and he would not be returning to see them again. 
all along the way, Paul had been warned by the Holy Spirit that he would face much persecution in Jerusalem. The believers pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem, but when they saw Paul's determination to follow God's Spirit, they cried and prayed as they hugged Paul goodbye. Traveling by ship, Paul and his companions arrived in Caesarea, just a few miles from Jerusalem. Paul did not know what lie ahead, but he knew that God was in control and that he had a plan for his life. At Caesarea, Paul stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist. While Paul was staying at Philip's house, a prophet named Agabus arrived from Judea. He took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands with it. He then said, The Holy Spirit declares that the owner of this belt will be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. Just as Agabus had prophesied, when Paul and his traveling companions arrived in Jerusalem, they were recognized by the Jewish leaders. These men falsely accused Paul of teaching Jews who live among the Gentiles to ignore the Jewish customs. They were very angry and wanted to discredit him. They started a mob riot that spread throughout the whole city. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment and Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. The commander arrested Paul and had him bound with two chains and ordered that he be taken to the fortress. The crowd followed behind, shouting, Kill him! Kill him! As Paul was about to be taken inside, he asked the commander if he could speak to the crowd. The commander gave permission for him to speak. Paul explained to the angry crowd that he was once a Pharisee like them and had zealously killed Christians. Then Paul told them how Jesus had appeared to him on the road to Damascus and how he had called on the name of the Lord to forgive his sins and had been baptized. But when Paul went on to say that God had sent him to bring the good news of Jesus to the Gentiles, there was an uproar. The enemies of Paul did not want the Gentiles to go to heaven. They wanted the Gentiles to obey the Jewish law. Then they began to shout, get rid of this man from the earth. He is not fit to live. The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him to be lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. But when the officer learned that Paul was a Roman citizen, he was untied immediately. The next day, the commander ordered the leading priest into session with the Jewish High Council. He wanted to find out what the trouble was all about. And so he brought Paul before them. But this meeting only ended with a huge uproar, and the commander had to rescue Paul by force. Paul was taken back to a cell in the fortress.
that night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem. You must preach the good news in Rome as well. The next morning, a group of 40 Jewish men got together and made an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. But Paul's little nephew overheard the plot and reported it to Paul. Paul called one of the centurions that was guarding him and told him, take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. After hearing about the plot, the commander ordered for Paul to be taken by 200 soldiers and 70 mounted troops to Caesarea during the night. In a letter, he asked Governor Felix to judge the case and hold Paul until his accusers could arrive. He asked Felix to keep Paul safe until he could be taken to Rome for a trial. Five days after Paul was escorted to Caesarea, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with some of the Jewish elders and the lawyer Tertullius to present their case. Tertullius presented the charges against Paul. He began by making flattering marks about Governor Felix. Then he went on to claim, Paul is a troublemaker who is constantly stirring up riots among the Jews everywhere. He is a ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarene. He was trying to desecrate the temple when we arrested him. The other Jews agreed with everything that Tertullius said. The governor then motioned for Paul to speak. Paul said, I arrived in Jerusalem no more than 12 days ago, but my accusers never found me arguing with anyone, anywhere. They cannot prove the charges they are now making against me. I admit that I worship the God of our Father as a follower of the way, which they call a cult. I believe in the Old Testament law and the prophets just as they do. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. My accusers saw me in the temple as I was completing a purification ceremony. There was no crowd around me and no rioting. I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. At that point, Felix, who was familiar with the way, adjourned the hearing. The governor knew the reputation of the Christians for living peacefully and not starting riots. So Felix said, wait until Lysias, the garrison commander arrives. Then I will decide the case. So Paul was kept in custody, but given freedom to allow his friends to visit him. A few days later, Felix and his wife Drusilla who was Jewish, sent for Paul. They listened as he told them about his faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul spoke about righteousness and self-control and the coming day of judgment, Felix became frightened. He was convicted of his own sins. <laughs> 
Uh, go away for now, he replied. When it is more convenient, I'll call for you again. Felix hoped that Paul would bribe him to get released, so he talked with him quite often. Felix, who also wanted to be popular with Paul's accusers, kept him in prison for the next two years. Felix then lost his job as the governor and was called back to Rome. He was replaced by Porcius Festus. When Festus took over as governor from Felix, the Jewish authorities asked for Paul to be put on trial in Jerusalem. They were hoping to ambush and kill Paul on the way. Festus instead agreed to a fresh trial in Caesarea. Once again, Paul denied the charges saying, I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws, or the temple, or the Roman government. Then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? No, Paul replied, this is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried here. You know I am not guilty. If I have done something worthy of death, I should die. But if I am innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisors and then replied, Very well, you have appealed to Caesar and to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister Bernice to pay their respects to Festus. They discussed Paul's case together. I'd, I'd like to hear the man myself, King Agrippa said. Festus replied, Well, then you will tomorrow. The next day, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Paul was brought in. Festus announced, This is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews. But, in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving death. However, since he appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what charge shall I make against him? Paul stood up and told them how he had encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and had become a Christian. He told them that God had called him to preach the gospel to both the Jews and the Gentiles. He said that the only reason he was on trial was that he preached that the Jews should repent of their sins and turn to God so they could receive forgiveness. Jesus had died on the cross and had risen from the dead. He said that they should believe in Christ Jesus as the promised Messiah. Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. Paul replied, I am not insane. Most excellent Festus, what I am saying is the truth. King Agrippa knows about these things. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. 
Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. As they went out, they agreed. This man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. King Agrippa and Bernice thought that Paul was making a mistake to appeal to Caesar. But Paul did not look at it this way. God had told him that he would preach the gospel in Rome, and he saw this appeal as a way to give him this opportunity. To go to Rome as a prisoner was better than not to go there at all. In this lesson, we see that Paul was risking his own life to preach the gospel. Just as Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leaders, Paul was also receiving the same treatment by the Roman governors. Because Jesus has the power to save people from sin, Paul was willing to do whatever it took to share the gospel with everyone. When we follow Christ and obey his commands, we too may be thought to be crazy, but that should not let this response stop us. People may make fun of us like they did for Paul, but in the end, God will reward our faithfulness. It will be worth whatever we may suffer. Jesus loves us and will strengthen us during these times of trial. When Paul was defending his case before the Roman governors, he appealed to them with the facts. He used examples of people who were still alive, who had heard Jesus and seen his miracles. They had seen the empty tomb and the fact that the message of salvation was turning their world upside down. These facts were an important part of Paul's testimony. The history of Jesus's life and the early church are facts that are still available for us today. We have the eyewitness accounts of Jesus's life recorded in the Bible. We can read about the events in the early church and how the early church leaders preached about Jesus. When we share the gospel with others, we need to strengthen our testimony by using scripture. In his preaching, Paul emphasized that Jesus was Christ, the Son of God, that he died on the cross for the payment of our sins, and that he rose again on the third day to prove that he had overcome death. God loves everyone, and he desires that they will be saved. As a result of his sacrifice, we are to repent of our sins and believe in him as our savior. We are to live a life that shows our repentance through our deeds. We are to share the good news of salvation with everyone. Our memory verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance.
that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now in these verses, Paul was emphasizing that Christ's resurrection from the dead was a fact. That fact is evidence that we can receive the gift of eternal life. Let's say our verse again. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul's response to King Agrippa and Felix is a good example of how we should tell others about God's plan of salvation. Just like Paul, we should share our personal testimony of how we came to know Christ as our Savior. Then we should use scripture to show God's promise of salvation to those who place their faith in him. Only then will others know our concern for them and the proof of God's gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this lesson about Paul's bold testimony of faith in you as he stood before the Roman rulers. Help us to tell others about God's salvation like Paul did. He trusted in you to give him courage to face the opposition of the Jewish leaders. Thank you for giving to us the gift of salvation. Give us the great desire to see others come to you in Christ. Thank you for promising to always be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember, use every opportunity to tell others about Jesus.